Hello and welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I'm your host, Lauren Zayu. Join me as we navigate the political communications ups and downs and ins and outs of our day. We're talking to leading experts on the issues that help our country move forward for the better. My guests and I promise to give you the history, the real, and the ideal. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I'm your host, Lauren Zayu. This summer, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, held the largest gathering of poor and low wealth people in the nation's history at the Mass Poor People's and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington into the polls. While gearing up for this major event, we got the chance to talk to Zilla Wesley about organizing in DC. Zilla Wesley is a native Washingtonian. She loves working in the DC community and towards the beloved community. Zilla earned her bachelor's in political science from the University of the District of Columbia. And at this time, she was working with the Cairo Center as a policy organizer. She's worked with the DC Poor People's Campaign and other collectives in the DC community. She was raised in People's Congregational United Church of Christ in Washington, DC. Growing up in the UCC helped her become the person she is today and gave her the fire for social justice. She loves DC and would like to see all people enjoy it. Zilla is about the liberation of people by transformative and healing organizing. I'm excited to welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered, Zilla Wesley. Hey, Lauren. Thank you for having me. Hey, girl. Hey, Zilla. Thank you for being here. Um, if we just want to get started with a bit about your background and how you got here today. Perfect. Um, oh, my God. So, like, I never considered myself an organizer probably until a few years ago because I, um, I was, like, all over the place just with life. You know, I... Um, you know, I was raised middle class, DC, you know, I had a cotillion, everything. So like, my life goal wasn't to be like in the streets, I guess. or like, how my life was set up wasn't like, necessarily where I am now. Um, but I always love to help people like I was a Girl Scout, my like, but the examples from like, my family were always helping community. So that's mm. like, really one way why I got there. Cause like, my grandmother is a good example of that. Well, both grandparents, both grandmothers, they would just really help out people in the community by either watching like people's children or like, um, like my one other, my, my grandmother D did hair. So she would do hair and then somebody else would do her laundry. So, you know, just to do that like bartering system from just the understanding of like people in like the deeper South, but DC still the South, you know, as much as people don't want to think it is, but we're under the Mason Dixon line. Um, so like that's that. Um, and then I went through school for a little bit. I went to like Old Dominion for a while when I first graduated. And then I came back up here and to, uh, went to, oh, but then when I was in Old Dominion, that was like some pivotal time too because I really um, help people register to vote. Um, I was part of Virginia Young Democrats for a while. I, um, you know, really learned a lot, but then I came home because it was just time to come home and it was good timing because my grandmother was transitioning to the next world. So just really helping with that is always, um, was very positive for me and just also got to see like the medical system in its entirety um, about how, you know, like Medicaid and um, social workers and how people get treated at certain places at certain price points. Um, with that, like that was like a pivotal moment for me where I'm just like, you know, experience life because you never know, right? Um, and so then I just worked odd jobs here and there because at that time I really wanted to be a teacher. So then I worked for an after school enrichment program um, and that was also... Another way where I saw like, no matter how hard teachers work, um, the system is flawed. Um, and the aftercare system is equally as flawed sometimes too. And like sometimes, and parents need help. Parents are struggling. They might not say that, but they are because they're trying to do the best of what they can do. Amen. Because um, even I know I had to do like, I did a lot of advocacy advocacy work and even just even talking with like parents and sitting in meetings with parents about you know like the um, 
the curriculum that their child's getting and if is this right or wrong. Um, and also at that same time, when I was working at a charter um, at the after school program, I was on the board of directors for the YWCA okay. for like a, a while because uh, it started, they were looking for women under 25. So I, I was their token under 25 person. Not so and that, yeah, yeah, it was like, it was like, like two of us for a while. One was like, it was like me, a like young black woman and another woman, um, Anna. And so like, we really, we really worked it out and like, we got some great opportunities. Um, I got to travel with that and represent you the United States. Um, in Thailand for a conference, we, I was even on the planning team for a conference in Barbados, which was really dope. We had women from like all over the Caribbean, Canada, and the United States, and, um, uh, parts of Mexico. And, um, and we really did that and really came and worked. Um, let's see. But with that, that really gave me tools that I now use a lot <laughs> in my organizing because, you know, to, to sometimes be an organizer in the way that like I've been trained up is to really be community based to be to help with transformation and not be transactional. So like, so all that experience really helped me. Um, and so in winter 2017, I started volunteering with the poor people's campaign kind of um, through, with Erica and Clinton. And we, um, you know, we were rocking it out doing flyers like they were doing panels. So I was helping support. I was on the DC committee. I was just a thing. And then you just as a member and moved from there. Cause I'm really, cause that's also one thing I'm really passionate about is the DC community and really having it equitable for everyone who lives here and like comfortable to. Um, and, and then I worked um, as a help with the DMV mobilization in 2020 before the, pan then the pandemic happened. Right. And then moved to Kairos. And now I'm here. Absolutely. Um, and we're definitely going to get into your work at Kairos here a little later. But just to sort of give people an overview, right? Like organizing is kind of a buzzword. It mm -hmm. means a lot of different things, a lot of spaces. But like, what does your day to day look like as an organizer in DC? Huh. Well, it like it. It's not a regular nine to five. Like, that's what I just tell people like off break. Um, because like the like people who you know we're trying to trans transform this this city with you know they work late or they work early so sometimes mm -hmm. I get texts at two in the morning about something like I'm sometimes on calls at like seven a.m. with people you know asked to like you know I've been asked to like can you help with um like a mutual aid or can you do this for me can you do that for me? Cause like showing up in an intentional way means that you have to show up just not like speaking at my event and I'll come speak at your event, but you come to like my smaller, like spoken word or like food pantry, or can you donate this? Or like, do you have a little bit of money that can help me? Or do you, can you pick up some groceries for the old, the seniors at my building? So like stuff like that, or can you like make this call? Cause we need somebody to listen as, you know, people are speaking, you know? Mm. Um, so that's it. The day, like day to day, every day is a different day. Yeah. <laughs> I will just safely say that. Um, but I love it cause I love connecting with people. So, and sometimes people just want to be listened to mm -hmm. and have their stories told um, and just really, um, just have people listen to them at the end of the day. So it's like, I do a lot of listening. I do a lot of like, you know, just making, like making people feel empowered and feel that like they're not taking crazy pills. Like this mm. system is jacked up and like, you know, in DC to really like afford anywhere here, you have to be making over $31 an hour, you know? So, you know, go to poorpeoplescampaign.com and look at DC's fact sheet, you know? Um, to really like understand some of the breakdowns of that. And like the reality is people are getting $15 an hour. That's cool. But that's not enough to really right. still make it. In that, in that model, even at $15 an hour, you would need two full-time jobs in order to afford an apartment. And like, that's, that's just the rent, right? Before right. we get into the cost of groceries and, and, you know, transportation and all the other things. 
utility um, is why it's, yeah. right they're required to actually live um mm -hmm. And so I definitely understand that. And as we transition into Hold Up, right, which is sort of where we get into things that people might not know about your work, I'm curious in particular if there are any um, misconceptions about organizing or something that you think people should know. Um, yeah, I think organizing is not a... It's not just like being behind your computer and or in the streets, right? It's a mix of both. Mm. Um, because like with this new future, digital organizing is a is a real reality. And there's a there's still the digital divide that's happening mm. in this country, in this city, and a lot of places. Cause like, yes, we have this luxury to like I can be in my room all day on emails, but no, but and the people that we are you know we're trying to activate are at work yeah. you know doing like second shift shit doing first second and third shift you know even you know or at their other job or somewhere else so the reality is we still got to be both places and really meet people where they are mm. um also to me it's not like an ego thing um mm. it's not a tie and a title thing um, because it's really like if you're genuine people will show up for you mm, yeah. um, and that's sometimes a challenge um, and it's like not it's not like a lifestyle choice you know what I'm saying because it's like I wear like broken stocks and like a, a something like that doesn't make me an organizer you know like mm. what makes you are <laughs> like I was trying to think of something like because it's like a lot of people think it's like, because you know how like Pinterest has like those outfits of like, yeah, you know, it's like one of those things. People think like if you look a certain way, you're an organizer. Like a lot of people are like, you know, and also find balance because a lot of people will live and breathe this and just focus and be so honed on like this that they're missing a lot of stuff. They're meeting, they're missing how they're treating themselves. They're missing how they're treating other people. And like, you need to integrate this in your life in a healthy way because sometimes people get into organizing because they're hurt or they were hurt on some type of level mm. and they haven't done their healing work or their light work and hurt people hurt people without even sometimes knowing that they're hurting. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um it, it that's that's very much a, a misconception. I think your your notion of like one organizing is not nine to five because right. often again the people who the poor people's campaign is organizing in particular are at work and so mm -hmm. like you're working during working hours but also outside of working hours in an effort to organize people. Right. Um because most people won't let you organize on the clock because <laughs> why would they do that? Right. Um, <laughs> and on top of that, I think that there is this um and I, it's something I've been thinking about since President Obama, actually, like because he started out as a community organizer. I think people get this notion that there's this like glamorous <laughs> side to organizing or that it's a stepping stone to getting into politics. And it's not. It's not either of those things. Um, organizing is important. It's intentional. And like having long term relationships with communities is not something to ever be taken for granted. And so um, part of, you know, all of this, particularly with the poor people's campaign model of like people organizing their own communities, like a lot of time political organizing looks like people parachuting into a place eight months before an election, not knowing anything about the spot but showing up to save people, right? And you're gonna show up and you're gonna vote blue and rah, rah, rah hey, hey. And then we're, the person is gone by December and never comes back again until four years later when they show up to do it again, right? And so it's not sustainable. People don't trust it. People are skeptical because this is someone, this is a relationship where you have shown up, professed to care about me until you got what you needed from me and left. Um, and that's not organizing either. And that's why I think we're not seeing sustained change in a lot of places. One of the many reasons why we're not seeing sustained change in a lot of places, because people aren't actively like rooted in communities that they're invested in. You're just sending people out 
with a clipboard and a gas card um, to organize some state in middle America. Right. I mean, and you said it. And then, and then with that, it's the disconnect of Mm -hmm. even sometimes people not understanding the conditions that you're walking into. Right. Um, Because like, that's why also a part of organizing that people don't really do is study, like study super Mm -hmm. important. Like, reading for yourself like reading to read up on like the conditions of the area you're in like understanding even also political security all of that wraps up because like the stuff that we are doing is like serious because like uniting the bottom and like trying to have like and trying to break down some of the systematic racism and like activate people to understand like you know, everything that's happening and taking blinders off is like a real thing and really like a um, scary thing for some powers that be. Mm -hmm. So it's like having the understanding of like political security and safety and knowing who you are. Cause that's why when like being authentic is the best you can do and people can tell. Um, Yeah. But, but you just said it correctly. Cause that, and, and that, that's a challenge in DC. It happens in DC all the time. People will parachute in, you know, stay here. And then there's people that are left behind to pick up the pieces. And, you know, and sometimes the pieces um, just don't get picked up because people are numb to it. Mm -hmm. um, And just not sad well I mean it makes me sad about like some situations like about that because it's like you could have really used this as a um a true mobile uh, like building base right and really getting people to rock out with you in like a genuine way instead of a celebrity type of way or worship type of way organizing is bigger than just the rally right right people um and so people like you don't get me wrong like movements and and events where people can express themselves programs where we speak truth to power are very important and critical at the same time organizing work organizing people um, in an effort to shift power structures is so much more than that um and so a lot of the work that the poor people's campaign is organizing around or the issues we're organizing around you know like there's the minimum wage there's the child tax credit there's like all these different policies that also influence our organizing work and so i wanted to talk to you about that you're in particular a policy organizer with the cairo center um and i want to talk about how you marry the two of those policy and organizing yeah perfect um yeah because i really because like that goes with like research and study so Mm -hmm. like we're really good at like taking some policy and really breaking it down and really talking to people about it. Cause sometimes policy is a scary thing. Cause in most of my conversations, I have bought up paid family leave and how like people should apply for it. And Mm -hmm. here's how to apply for it. You know, I even send people the website, um, even how, and use examples that like people like tag words that people hear, like, you know, that, that, that child, Oh, if I could talk, the child tax credit was really helpful yes. for a lot of people. And they were like, yeah, it was. And then like, I break that down to them on like how, you know, there's enough money for us to like, keep it all the time, you know? And they're like, true. And then like, how do you go about it? I'm just like, you know, here's the poor people's campaign website. This is some of the stuff we're talking about, you know, even when it comes to statehood and all of that is like, cause that's one thing that um, that's in the principles of the poor people's campaign is statehood for DC. And so like, you know, even bringing that up and they're just like, cool. And then even just trying to help people imagine what that would look like. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of that is just like taking like, cause like sometimes to me, policy seems like scary for people and people mm-hmm. sometimes shut down when it comes to government because people are like floating heads and just like talking so much because like yet again, Obama, that's what he was so brilliant as an organizer slash politician is like, he broke it down to people to understand because like, cause that's technically like organizing one-on-one is meet people where they are, you know, mm-hmm. because like a lot of people just like to use big words and like 
all of that. But the reality is, like, not everyone is going to, like, want to use the word with, like, wherewithal and, like, <laughs> make sure you're using amongst or among you the right way, you know? And it's just, like, sometimes you just want to sit down and kick it with somebody and be like, you know what? You should, you know why you should vote? So we can all do our build back better shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, you just really got to like get down with the people. Cause like, but like also be your authentic self. Like, cause if you are not like. <laughs> You're not actually. Cause that's <clears throat> a lot yeah. of people pretend, particularly yeah. if we can be honest in urban communities, yeah. right? Like show up and you know, you, you sound ridiculous. You look ridiculous. Um, attempting to like relate to people. And that's just not the way to do anything because people can feel authenticity. They can feel it a mile away. And so even if like, I don't agree with you all the way, but I know you're being authentic and honest with me, that goes further with me than someone who's saying everything, you know, that I like, but I don't know if I can believe them. Cause I don't know if you're being genuine. Oh yeah. Cause just like the people who, yeah. Cause some of the New York who just be like, like just be using hand stuff because they're in like urban areas, and I'm like, no, <laughs> stop it, Susan. Okay, <laughs> please. Like you're you're doing the most, but yet the least, and you're turning people off. You know, Absolutely. I mean, because you can see when people start shutting down, mm. and then like I get like quiet phone calls and be like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. <laughs> you're just like, you know, <laughs> you're, you're like, like, I don't know either. Oh, I can be know. honest. Right. I don't know either. Yeah, yeah it, it gets well. here, but yeah, but it's also, but it's a way where, and I don't know who says this. It's either like, uh, Reverend Theo Harris or Bishop Barber, but it's like we need to make many Martins, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like a good organizer. At the end of the day, should help people feel empowered, mm -hmm. and honor their story and honor them and trust them enough that like if I give you this paperwork I know that you can organize your house or your uh, church or your whatever mm -hmm. the the thing is that I need to set you up for success yes mm -hmm. setting people up for success is absolutely pivotal um and actually as we transition into I ain't sorry right like what are some of the mantras that you've developed as a person, either personally or professionally, that help you do the work that you do? Uh, that this is not about me. This is for mm. the greater good. I can safely say I have changed that a little bit, mm -hmm. as in it's about all of us, including yeah. myself. Um, mm -hmm. Because if um, in a way, I'm also like breaking down the community because if, and yet again, I mean, it goes back to my earlier point. If, if we are all like jacked up and trying mm -hmm. to heal a community or help heal a community or being with community or be in community with a community that's trying to heal and you have your own issues that you're not trying to work out at all, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, also, don't be perfect and I don't know all the answers that's another mantra because like and just show up as your authentic self um everybody rises is another one and then there's always another chance to mm. grow mm. say more about that there is always another chance to grow but, yeah because like some people come with the mindset that it needs to be perfect or needs to be a certain way the reality is like it's different chance like you can grow whatever way you need to grow you know because it's like trees some dr trees grow in the shade some trees really need the sun mm -hmm. however they're still growing and so like if I you know miscommunicate something you know go back and apologize and that's okay instead of just like not doing that yeah. Um, you know or if I hurt somebody's feelings or came in a little bit too raw rock talk to them about it so I don't leave any wounds you know and just mm -hmm. say like throw somebody off with that so like that's really what I mean by that because it's always another chance because as long as you're breathing and you're here on this earth you know 
that. And I guess the classic is you only get what you're organized to take. And ah, yes. that is the OG classic one. Mm-hmm. And that's what um, I believe. And, you know, and there's a difference. I mean, there's, and then you got your, and then also knowing your team, because you really like, like be, give, give parts of yourself to everybody, but not everyone needs to have parts of yourself. I know that sounds really <laughs> okay. I just talked out of both sides of my mouth, but every like, but it goes to like the authentic, authentic is key is like you show up for who you are. Yeah. And, but sometimes you need to know that sometimes people aren't going to show up for you in the same way that you're going to, sh- you're showing up for them, mm-hmm. but you got to honor yourself in that. Like, I'm going to show up for them because I'm here. This is in me. This is how my calling in life and my pathway. And I feel like the universe put me here for that. So those are really some of the mantras I do because it's like, and really boundaries. And I mean that for yourself Yeah. because it's easy to like get caught up in this work. Cause the other day I was out and I was like, Oh shit, I forgot to eat. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's very problematic. Um, And it's just like, you can't do that because you know your body gets sore, your body gets tired from all this marching. I mean, you, shit, you know we were yeah. in the trenches together. We were. So, like. we were. And it's it's so interesting. A couple of things. One, I want to talk about like the the growth that I feel like. So you were talking about like you know there's always room to grow, mm-hmm. and like even the growth I've felt in the last like year or so with the fusion model that the campaign does, like there are places that I would have been like very uncomfortable to be in. Right. I think about us being in like rural West Virginia. Right. Or, you know, Montgomery, Alabama. Right. Or, you know, the, the thought is that like those places are unsafe for people who look like us. And I don't mean that to, you know, cast them in a particular light. I'm just saying those are the narratives that are around about them. Right. And so it means something for the campaign to organize like, in the streets of Harlem, right, in Raleigh, North Carolina, but also in the hills of West Virginia, also in, you know, the rural South, because these problems are are all of, are, are continuous and cycled together. And because there are so many areas where they try to divide people, like, I think sometimes we don't see those as issues, or we, we don't see the continuity in, in what we're all dealing with. Is, is something I thought about as you were talking. So like, that's growth for the organizers. That's growth for, you know, leadership. Um, and, and particularly on growing leadership, right? You see the leadership looks different in different places, right? So sometimes we're organizing with other organizers. Sometimes it's organizing clergy. Sometimes it's organizing, you know, shift leaders. Sometimes, you know, it's just community leaders who have been there for years and people revere. Like, and so understanding that leadership looks different in different parts of the country, uh, but we have to keep all of that um, in mind when you're looking for people who folks trust, because again, like we can't be everywhere at the same time. And so leaving, um, you know, like, like un- the, pe- the work being understood by the people who are directly impacted is what is going to keep the movement growing. Like one, two, you only get what you're organized to take. I think that's so important because I think ironically the narrative of this country works the other way. So I see on Twitter a lot, (laughs) people are always like, whose idea was it for us to work five days and only be off two? Like who came up with that? And I'm like, well, the issue here is that you don't know labor history because the issue used to be that you worked seven days a week. Right. We fought for the weekends. That wasn't wasn't like, oh, we all had all our freedom seven days a week and somebody decided we should work five of them, right? right. So, you know, we had to organize. So if you want, you know, three-day weekends or a four-day work week, which I do support, by the way, um, I think like, like you have to organize to take that. It's not that somebody's going to give that to you. It's not that um, there's a world where you're going to get the entire week off. Like you have to organize, take it, and then continuously defend it. Because as we're seeing now with voting rights, I think people thought after 
the Voting Rights Act that this was something that was going to be fine. Like, oh, what do you mean? We won our rights. Well, guess what? They came back for them, as the empire will continue to do across all areas. Um, and so you can't, like, you have to organize, take it, and then be ready to defend it on top of that. Right, yeah, because that's why one thing that people, I use all the time, and people are just like, what? But I use the Drake quote, like, we're all on the same path wearing different shoes mm. and in the same building we're having different mm-hmm. views. Yeah, And, like, people are just like, what? And, I, and you know, I'd be like, the good Scorpio prophet, Drake, you know? <laughs> because, like, but that's right there, you know, because we are all in a place where we need to understand that, like, you got to hit it in different levels and different things, but really have the wherewithal to have the understanding to know labor history, um, you know, um, to understand systematic racism, to understand that this has all been... Policy has help with this because like 19, 19, 1640 was the John Punch case in Virginia, you know, Mm -hmm. and like that history where it really literally all of them, it was John Punch. He was a indentured servant from off the continent and two from um, Scotland. One was from Scotland, one was from Ireland and they all ran away together. John Punch was, he had to do servitude to the Commonwealth of Virginia for the rest of his life. The other two had only had to serve 20 years and then was freed and whole got a whole freedom package with like some land and a house and all that. So like that really says to me how stuff is the divide and conquer is real. Mm-hmm. And they they want to keep us with chaotic energy because uh, sometimes I feel like it is very chaotic <laughs> and like, um, you know, in silo that it's, that's why it's like, what we fight for, like you said, I mean, you said it so perfectly, like we have to like fight for it and continue to fight for it so we can really understand. And, and it's another one that we say a lot is so people can stick and stay in a movement mm, yeah. and, and even doing it in ways where they might not sit. And that goes back to my Drake quote, not like to be here, but like still advocate for people living in poverty mm-hmm. in whatever you're doing, because it's a, it's a lot of people, 140 million 140 you know? million and they're all not black people so oh no 140 million that. people is almost half the country like right. that is a significant number that is as far as people who live below the poverty line or one emergency away that's one flat tire one medical emergency one dead car battery one job loss one natural disaster right. um completely and totally uh and as we but also like the work that we do while we work with people who are somewhat um, uh, in in situations that I think it would be easy to cast, um, to honestly cast them out, there is so much joy and so much um, community found in so many places where we organize. And on that note, I want to ask you, Zilla, what, if anything, is giving you hope right now? Um, just the people who are coming up to me who are like, yeah, I've heard of the poor people's campaign. I'm mm-hmm. coming. They might not have RSVP'd online, but <laughs> they're coming. Right. So, I mean, and I, and I believe that they're coming because I don't know why they would even forfeit that information because I didn't even ask. Um, so like with that said, I do think the word of mouth is key and like people are bringing their friends who are bringing their friends. And, you know, even though I was on a call the other day and they're like, we're hosting, like, a couple was like, we're hosting some people, you know? So um, it's real. That gives me hope. And just the idea that, like, for myself, living into a future that we want to see, you know? Mm-hmm. And, like, and that starts with within because that's, you know, probably organizing 102 is self-awareness, you know? Mm-hmm. And just of self and your surroundings and the conditions because, like, People are hungry for uh, mm. something and you can tell because even like, I probably, I don't know if I should mention this, but like if you even hear the people like during the insurrection, right? Like the people who weren't like trying to shoot up the place, but like they were really saying some of the stuff that we're saying, but they were activated by the wrong people, you know? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. the thing is that we just need to get information out there in a tangible edible way and like and to your point like that's why I like that we go into West Virginia Mm -hmm. and 
because even one moment where I was like, wow, is like we we were in the lobby of like that hotel um, and like somebody came and gave one of us $20 and they were like, can you just give this to mm-hmm. the campaign? I love the work y'all do, you know? Mm-hmm. And even just the people just even reading our shirts and being curious about yeah. it. And then even seeing us in our times of joy, because a lot of people fear joy Mm -hmm. um, and just even fear freedom, because that's sometimes our challenge is and free liberation. Um, And when we are sitting like at dinner after stuff and it's like really like Martin's dream that we think it that was just his like one part of his I have a dream speech where it's like really a fusion movement and it's like you know, people of all colors, shapes, sizes, sexual preferences and backgrounds are like here and we're joking and laughing together and people just walk by Mm. and are just like, interesting, you know? And it's not like necessarily a thing, but it gets their, it gets their gears moving and then they read our shirts and they're just like, hmm. And, Mm. you know, I don't, I mean, I don't know if people are like going at home and like Googling (laughs) like what poor people can't, people's campaign is afterwards but it's one of those things where you know your inner your interaction with somebody can either make or break their experience with you and so sometimes our interaction with people really like brings them a snippet of something different than Mm -hmm. what we're conditioned to do because even the fact like um miss pam Mm-hmm. is always like thank you for coming to West Virginia well all of West Virginia's committee is like thank you for coming to West Virginia because like if you're not feeling seen at all then you stop trying because yeah. and also that's this is another thing I use is like Horton here's a who because mm-hmm. that little like flower at the end when it's about to get dipped in oil and all the who people who are living on the flower are like we're here we're here you know yeah. like that's one of the things that we are because it's a lot of people who you know keep trying things and switching it up and all of that and yet aren't being heard but having like one or two people hear you Mm -hmm. and even a whole campaign coming to support you is very powerful and changing for people Mm -hmm. and that's what brings me hope that is fantastic i i completely agree um, our last segment for the show is called Drunk in Love, uh, <laughs> where we talk about, you know, uh, I give you a couple of minutes uninterrupted for any type of closing thoughts or things that you wish you had gotten a chance to talk about earlier. Um, and for this one, we are talking about the Mass Poor Peoples and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and to the polls on June 18th, 2022. Take it away. Well, I need y'all to just come, you know, just get the homies and everybody tweet about it facebook about it instagram about it take do a tiktok on your ro- on your road trip here you know to june 18th because it's going to be a transform a transformative event uh to me and it's going to be a um a stepping stone to what's next and not just for like the poor people's campaign but for this country because we're at a moral crossroads that needs to be really honored right now because we are at a point where no matter who's in office, the people aren't being heard, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, because Build Back Better could have helped a lot of people. And that was just a snippet of what we could get, right? Um, because right now, a lot of us are still fighting for scraps. And so many people have so much, like, Fucking like he just Elon Musk bought Twitter for like forty four billion, right? Four billion dollars. A B, and it's like yo, like we could have done one of that in the just in the United States could have just like been powerful, fix potholes, yeah, help people turn into solar energy, like get housing for unhoused people, or even just like a drop like shit that's like 80 drop 80 000 drop-in centers i don't know i don't know the math but it's just no, like, yeah yeah it's a lot it it's is a lot, a lot and there is so the the equality gap the wealth gap the it 
it's egregious. It's mm -hmm. egregious. It's immoral um, to live in a world where there is so much wealth, particularly mm -hmm. so much of it made like during a global pandemic when so many people were suffering and then we come, we're not out of the pandemic, um, but people are still suffering. And it's, uh, it, it, it is frustrating. It is scary to think about. Um, and I think that we are definitely at a crossroads. I completely identify with what you're saying there because ironically, and keep in mind, like I'm a political person. Anybody who listens to my show knows that. Um, this is not a political problem. Well, this is a political problem, but it's also a moral problem mm -hmm. in that like I, while capitalism definitely has its issues, the issue, the sole issue here is, is greed and lack of compassion and lack of interest in your fellow man and it, it fellow person. And it's not okay, for lack of a better word. And mm -hmm. so I, I, while people, you know, want to talk about like us transitioning to socialism or communism and all, while I do think there's room for a lot of political perspectives at the table, in the event we do not fix greed, in the event we do not call out greed for what it is as being sinful, as being evil, as far as like the love of money being the root of all evil, then we are really just like, as you mentioned, like we're changing like uh, politicians, but the, like the people aren't gonna be heard regardless. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, because I mean, even because what you just said sparked my, sparked my mind, because even like how people are like, you know how some of these churches have fallen off right because it's mm. like you want for one hand you're saying money's evil mm. and then you're turning around the next second some you know some of these churches you gotta like give your tax um mm. stub to oh, see yeah. to see who like how much you're really making but the reality is like and that's also what i appreciate about working for cairo center and doing work with the poor people's campaign is really the liberation of you know the story of jesus and like his disciples and um, the other religions as well, um, really. And even people who just like are like Wiccans and are mm -hmm. into nature, like just hearing the liberation of all of that really yeah. shows that like we are in a place where soon we'll all, we either need to start swimming together and just keep swimming or yeah. we're about to sink together and that's my that's my thing and that's why to me june 18th is super important to come because you know there is also a, another election you know there's always going to be an election coming up presidential election will be soon enough and no matter who's in office the people need to say you know like the preamble of the constitution like i have right here is like we the people you know what i'm saying cuz uh the white men who made it, you know, owned slaves and did whatever they had to do. But however, you lost your receipt now at this point. So not lost your receipt. Uh, the people are here, you know, no takesies, backsies, you know. Right. So like we're here and um, you know, and figure out how to really make and and I believe we can do it. We just need to break down the silos and people need to step into love instead of stepping into fear. And Absolutely. stepping into like the old ways, because the reality is, it's like y'all, we need each other to survive. You know, Absolutely. like the like that gospel song says. Yeah, no, and that was and, the first thing I thought of. We need, yeah, I need you. Yeah. You need me. Yeah, and it's we a, really do. We we need each other, and I think mm -hmm. that, that you put it well. We can either swim together or sink together. Um, yeah. But either way, we're actually together. And yeah. So you. <laughs> and I, you and I, like as much people don't want to think that we have like a lot of us have more in common than we want to realize like all of us want to just like live and thrive and not just live to survive right mm -hmm. and also something else she said where I was like damn you were smart on because we are we're in a place where like these these fake barriers are really killing us, like yeah, literally. Absolutely. And like June 18th is a way to see fusion, to see a different dream because like, mm -hmm. and even if you read other passages of Martin, like he was kind of alone at this time because even some of the black church people left turn behind absolutely. and all of that. And it's just like, y'all, we, we need to do better because, um, but you know, I believe we gonna make it, so we gonna make oh. it. 
We well, make it. and June 18th is, is the start of that. So much of uh, the work we've put in, uh, the mobilization tour that we're currently a part of, it's all um, leading to June 18th as, as the declaration. Because again, we also know that moving on from that, we're asking people to really organize their communities. Uh, this is slated to be the largest gathering of foreign low wealth people that this country has ever seen. And it's happening in the nation's capital. Um, in the event, you know, there's something that you're interested in attending. Uh, there's so much information, but start with poorpeoplescampaign.org slash June 18th. Um, you can be a mobilizing captain. You can bring your apartment complex. You can bring your community center. You can bring your family. You can come yourself. We've got buses. People, um, people are you know, road tripping together, you can catch a flight, Greyhound is still operating, Megabus is still operating, you know, throw on a mask and come on because okay. we uh, honestly are, are we, this, this is a pivotal moment in our country's history. Um, and as we wrap things up here, I'm going to give Zilla a moment to give closing thoughts. And then um, from there on out, uh, we, I will have the information for um, the event itself in in the notes for this episode. Zilla? Yes. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, and even come the day before, because we're having a community dinner mm -hmm. um, with the whole D with a lot of DC community and a lot of people of faith. Also, we're doing a memorial service for all the people that we died, you know, almost a million people from COVID-19 uh, and also this jacked up healthcare system. Yeah. Um, we'll be honoring all of them because, you know, the reality is that we and this goes with like your greed thing is like greed and money is pushed upon us on so many ways and like the reality is like half of us don't have boots the other ones don't have straps so we mm. can't pull anything up <laughs> if we're doing that like credit card debt is up 45 percent so like let, let's make that make sense you know and like the reality is if we fight together for money if we fight together for, and even like the whole COVID CDC thing, like if we don't work for five days, it shows, it showed how people could really shut down this country if we really wanted to and work together. And that's some of the stuff that we really have to start unlearning within ourselves and really start treating each, stop treating each other like we're expendable yeah. because we're not. Absolutely. Thank you, Lauren, for completely. Um... One second, I'll wrap up here. You just finished this episode of Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. If you're looking for the show, you can find us at Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered.com and also on Facebook and Instagram. And if you're looking for me, you can find me at, at Lauren Zayu on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for joining us.